Uh, we did it, day three. Congrats, everybody. I am very, very blessed to have this many of you in the room on the last day. I personally know how energy wanes at the end. Uh, so thank you for coming. Uh, how many of you, this is your first Coalesce? Okay. How many people here have been working with DBT or data for more than, let's say, one year? Okay, how many for more than two years? Five years? 10? Yeah, there we go. <laughs> All right, I took my first data class in graduate school in time immemorial, and it wasn't called data science back then, it was called data mining, which I actually think is a cool name that we should bring back, because <laughs> I felt like it wasn't intended to be this way, but it actually did feel like we didn't know if we were gonna find something. You know, like we were like a bit on a, a bit of a hunt. It's like you're trying to learn some clustering techniques and you're like, maybe we'll uncover insights about household data. I think it was usually like household. It was like Bureau of Labor Statistics. It was always that was the data set. Um, and like you had the tools. Believe it or not, I used something called SPSS at the time. If you don't know, you're lucky. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so you've got the tools, you've got the problem, you've got the data set, you even sometimes had teammates, and ideally you find some kind of magical gold, like some kind of insight. Or you don't, more likely you don't. But I actually think the worst thing is when you find an insight and then nothing happens. Uh, I think that is actually the much, much worse problem in all like walks of data life. And I think it's because our job is not to uncover insights. That, that's what it feels like it might be, but our job is actually to drive better business decisions that ideally also drive revenue and the bottom line, ideally. We live in a world where sometimes profit doesn't have to happen, but ideally, uh, uh, that's what our job is. And that's not what happens. And I think that's what I wanna explore today. Uh, I'm gonna give you instant early warning that there will not be a magic answer today. Just. Just, there's gonna be a lot of advice and patterns I've seen over the last few years. So uh, I haven't always worked in data, but for the last five years, I, uh, um, I have not led a data function, I have not been an analyst, I have watched data teams of all sizes at all kinds of companies. Uh, I've tried to give them automated pipelines, so I've got to see how they operate. And I have seen lots of different kinds of teams. I've seen uh, like at this point I've probably observed, you know, like hundreds and hundreds of teams. I have seen the one person, you know, the superstar, that like everyone goes to this person, there's only one in the company. I have seen the massive team and the massive teams also split into different kinds. Uh, so it's like, what do you wanna be when you grow up, right? And uh, some of them are kind of like an IT team. They're really focused on governance, control, just making sure everything is right. Uh, and some of them are a lot more focused on experimentation and and growth, which I think is the, the side I tend to fall under. And it's kind of the classic, are you working on the back office mentality or like the front office mentality? Are you helping me make money or save money? And both are good, but trust me, in anyone's career, you wanna be helping people make money. Uh, like most CEOs, if you meet them somewhere and you go like, what are you worried about? They don't go like saving on my, you know, kind of server costs. Like well, maybe there's snowflake costs sometimes, but, <laughs> But like, it's usually not gonna be at the like, top of the hierarchy of problems. And so it behooves us to work in that side. So what the hell is revenue anyway? You have an accounting team, they will teach you. If you don't already know, like, there's definitions of what revenue is. Uh, and we can debate about bookings versus revenue versus revenue run rate. There's a lot of ways to kind of look at it. Uh, but the essence, right, is like how much money we make and ideally with a bottom line, that's, that's, that's super important. Um, but the, the most important thing is knowing that number is one thing, so, but it's an all-encompassing number, right? Like the, the, the number you report back up to like say the CFO or the CRO or the CMO or the whoever is the wrap-up total. And that's the number we're all supposed to make get bigger. But that's almost like too all-encompassing. So our job is actually to figure out the inputs that make that something. So when I ask my accountant, how much money do we make? I kind of don't really care about that number as much as I, I wanna know what were the causes, what are the levers? And that is what you 
that's what you need to know in order to drive something, which again, I don't like the term drive. It's like very corporate speak at this point. But like to grow something, you have to know what causes it to move. Uh, and if you don't know, then you need to just try stuff until you know, uh, which is the, 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 the first probably piece of advice I'm going to give. So the way I'm going to structure this talk today, I'm going to like walk through a lot of failure modes. Because again, that's kind of the theme of the presentation, right? It's like, why do we fail at doing this thing that is technically our job? So there's lots and lots of ways I've seen fail, and hopefully some of these you will recognize. Uh, the, the truth is like, I am an engineer myself, and so I, I get locked into trying to solve whatever's in front of me and optimize whatever's in front of me, and probably the biggest thing that I've learned is that like, you might be working on things that feel important or feel attackable, solvable, improvable. I'm sure everywhere, like anything in your company right now can be improved. This is a given. Uh, uh, so can you. Uh, but actually the key is maybe you shouldn't. And, and identifying where you should not spend time is, is, is a very valuable thing to do uh, as a team and as an individual. So I'm going to see if I can hopefully get you there. All right, it's Coalesce. So obviously we're going to talk KPIs. Uh, how many of you, like, is this like, how, how, how many of you think you crush at this? Like you have the best KPIs, you know your team is driving the right KPIs. Nobody, yes. Okay, uh, all right, well this is good, so you should get better at this, right? Um, so just get the right KPIs. Uh, uh, that's no problem, it's no problem. Uh, the, the, okay, so the rule of thumb you wanna follow here is like, I'm not gonna teach you, I, again, you can go call your accounting team and ask them about the big numbers ones. Uh, I think what's more important for us to bring to the table is to think in terms of A, rates of change, right? Cohorts and inputs. So it matters most to know what causes the dollar thing to change, not what is the dollar thing. Uh, and so that is, it can be things like user engagement, right? That can have a, like an impact on revenue downstream. It could be, uh, product, like retention. There's a lot of obvious things that you can come up with. Um, for some kinds of companies, it might be related to uh, inventory even, right? Like that can have the effect uh, on, on the downstream, on the bottom line. So your job is to figure out the inputs and then to always, 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 again, this is, it sounds obvious, but it's shocking. Shocking how often this is not looked at. Just take the derivative. of Whatever it is you're doing, just take the derivative and you automatically level up. You'd be amazed how many founders don't track derivatives. Uh, uh, and they just go like, I have this, I made this much. <laughs> and like, how was that compared to last week or last month? And you can take that across all sorts of dimensions. And so cohorting is the easiest thing to do if you're gonna cohort is like do it over time. That's already good. What do December customers look like this year versus December last year? Uh, that is hugely useful. You can cohort on other things too, right? You can cohort on uh, kinds of customers or kinds of uh, entry points into your into your product into your kind of company's offerings. All of those are really useful because again, if you have an insight about something dropped, oh no, like revenue dropped this month, or like sales of this gadget dropped this month. Okay, why? What changed? We don't know. So if you can tie it to a cohort, you're basically just going to get a lot closer to finding the source of the, the bug, or ideally the thing that we can do to make it go up, right? So this is number one probably reason people don't drive revenue is they're not actually tracking the things that can cause it to change. Okay, second one, this is a, this is a classic. This is the most depressing because it's very easy to solve. Uh, you're not actually, you know, the tree falls and you're not there. It's as simple as that. How many, like you all operate in something called resembling a data team, right, I'm gonna assume, or you have, the, you have the title within another organization. Um, how many of you go to meetings that are not data team meetings, like data meetings? It's like half, not even, like a third maybe. You should. Here's the thing. Companies are full of people who don't realize A, you exist, B, that you can do something for them. Heck, they're not even literate in like what, what we would call data. I don't mean like they know how to write SQL, okay? Forget, that's like level three literacy or something. I mean they don't realize that the thing that they do can have data applied to it. 
So here's something you could do. I'm serious, by the way. This is not like, this is very actionable. Just go to random meetings. Like, just be a fly on the wall. Don't even say you're here for a reason. I'm like, you're just going to listen. And if you don't know which team to go to, if you're trying to guess, like, go to the marketing team meeting. 100% go to the marketing team meeting. They spend the most, they waste the most, and they think they're scientists, and they are not. Uh, but don't, don't ask for anything. Just be like, I'm just going to listen, and I might help you. Like, it might be just like a bonus. Like, just, I'm just going to be a fly on the wall and listen. You would be freaking shocked how many things happen once you just know the problems they're dealing with every day. Uh, so this is very easy to do and super common. Uh, and by the way, the, this begets more. So prepare yourself. Once you go and you are helpful, we will enter into a, fail, a later problem, which is like now you have too many people who want stuff. So we'll get to that. Uh, but it's actually super, super empowering to do this. And like it's always interesting to watch people go like, yeah, I don't go to, who wants to go to those meetings? Um, you don't want to go to those meetings because you want to automate your pipelines, right? You want to make your shit like way better. Uh, like I said, I, I have the most trouble with this one for two reasons. One, I'm an engineer by like, you know, formation, and I love optimizing things. I love making things go faster and better, and like programmers are always famously lazy. And so, so if you do something three times, you're like, I should just automate this, even if the automation will take me 800 hours, but it's like worth it because it's this beautiful thing that's like, it's automated now. Uh, so I personally have trouble with this. And I even have further trouble because I sell a product that is automated pipelines. So I'm literally trying to sell you automation. And so I should not say this, but the truth is making things go faster is not necessarily going to drive anything in the company. And this is kind of scary to think. And I say this because there are, like I do think giving people better data faster is good. Like that actually can have an effect. Uh, like, it makes everyone more productive, which actually can just drive general uh, uh, outcomes. But you can't know that a priori. Like, you really do have to think to, like, why this thing should be there. And, you know, this is going to sound very, like, kind of just of du jour, but uh, this is, like, everyone's talking about it right now because there's, like, this Elon Musk biography that came out, right? Say what you will about the man. Uh, uh, but... One of the things that they say in all of their in all of his companies is like anytime there's a process, step one, try to kill it. Just just see if you can delete it first. And I think it's it's an extreme attitude, but it's it's a useful thing to keep in your mind. It's like people will usually ask you to just optimize a thing that's there. Oh, we've been collecting this number in a spreadsheet for three months. Can you just make it automated in insert whatever tool the team is using? And that feels good. Like it feels like you're helping the team. You're doing what they want you to do. But is that going to make a difference in how they make decisions and at what velocity they make decisions? I'm not sure. So it, it behooves us to ask that question is, I guess, kind of my point and, and get away from this very enjoyable task of automating things. Um, OK, another failure mode is a different part of the forest. It's not that you're not there. It's actually that there are only, I think there are only two teams in a company. And tell me, feel free to raise your hand and tell me I'm wrong about this that actually have visibility over the whole. There's the accounting team, but we're not at an accounting conference. Uh, and there's the data team. And what I mean by this is like, you can see the whole picture. You can see what comes from billing, from product, from marketing, from sales, from warehousing, you know, I mean the physical warehousing if you're in that kind of business. Um, and all of your stakeholders, they don't, right? In fact, by design, they're like laser focused on their thing. So, uh, you often don't provide the value that you should, which is to bring the kind of overall perspective. I'll give you an example. Just last night, I was talking to someone, so one of you, uh, uh, and they work in a retailer, right? So they have physical stores and online. Uh, and at this point, I think anyone who had a physical store must also have an online store, right? Uh, uh, I'm sure even Hermes probably sells stuff online. Um, so here's the thing the users split, right? There's users who only go to a store, there's users who only shop online, and then there's users who do both. And those teams don't know about that. Only the data team, and I guess again, payments, sees the two. And it has all sorts of weird interplay, right? Where you wanna make sure that should you send, if the online team is running out of inventory, do you steal from the physical stores or not? 
physical store is going to say no. Online team is going to say hell yeah. We are the ones who have the visibility, right? To see like what is the machinery we should build. And I think that is, that's the thing that we have to bring because otherwise you might move numbers up, but it might not affect the whole. And like the famous versions of these are like, you know, marketing wants to just move this like lead thing up, but then the sales team doesn't do anything with it. These are the famous ways in which you can move a metric up and nothing happens. And this is, we should be the best at this. Like this is where I almost don't blame salespeople for not knowing that the marketing team did a thing. Like it's, they should, but like I, I can kind of understand. They're very focused on their slice. And, and so it would suck to do good work and then not have it drive growth. And so this is one of the ways in which you can change that. Okay. <laughs> this is like the corollary. This is the corollary to insights lead to inaction. Uh, you're always gonna feel like we're just one away. Right? Just like one more insight and maybe things will happen this time. If I give them this one, this will ha it'll work. It'll really work. Um, so if you start going to the meetings, they will start asking for things and you will get data requests like It'd be, it's amazing even how many people don't have like a ticketing system given how many requests they have. But the truth is there will always be another dashboard to fix or there will always be someone who needs something. If you're a team of one, you're overwhelmed. And if you're a large team, you almost like say no to everybody. So you can try to maintain one of the 532 dashboards that are in the company. And you don't want to do that, right? You can, how can you think about experimentations that might drive growth if you're busy freaking just handling orders all day, right? You're like the McDonald's, like, I'm just receiving orders. I, what am I supposed to do? So you're going to have to, if you want to move away from being this kind of IT uh, custodian of like, I just get responses and I, like requests and I just have to decide whether, when and where I'm going to disappoint them, you, you have to like give them something else, right? And we talk a lot about data as an engineering discipline, obviously, here at Coalesce. We talk a lot about data as a product. Well, if you're going to take away the requests, you're going to have to come with something better. <laughs> so that's the hard part, right? If you're going to give them less, then we have to make it better. And so that gets to the hopefully, like, let's stop complaining and let's see if we can figure out what would make, what would make all of this better. And again, I'm going to say the same warning I said earlier, like, I don't have a panacea. This is just things I have seen that work <laughs> and that move things in the right direction. Okay. Did I? I feel like I skipped one, but anyway, uh, it'll come back to me. So um, start small, start small. This is counterintuitive. Uh, uh, people, especially when you're selling products and trying to pitch a vision for a team, you always gotta pitch it as like, I'm gonna change everything. And you should be ambitious and you should try to conquer all the things, but find one receptive team. And again, if in doubt, marketing. Just, if you don't know, just go with them. But any team might do. Like they just have to have a goal, a number that they want to move and that you can help them with. And it, the key here is to find someone who, you already have stakeholders, this is not new. I'm saying someone who wants to work with you to move a metric, not report a metric. Like how many of you right now are doing something that involves where your job is actually to change the outcome, not tell people you're failing? This is way too small, right? So this is, okay. So just find one. So okay, how many people here work, this is like we're in October, how many people here work in some form of e-commerce, retail, whatever, like something related to shopping of any kind? A couple, okay, not a lot. Uh, Thanksgiving's coming in a month, right? So, or so. That's, I think, America's biggest shopping day. There's gonna be a ton of like drive-by people, right, that come by on that day for shopping, I assume. There's probably a lot of people who go for like, there was a deal on a TV, bought the TV, done. And then you're gonna get some kind of nonstop drip campaign from that point on from like the marketing team of that company to go, hey, we exist, we exist, don't forget about us. Well, you could take one project, like just in that little slice, you could say, well, what if we, um, we looked at what products are associated, which purchases are associated with long-term retention, which is actually far more important than driving a single purchase, especially today. And what if we drive a campaign with the marketing team that says we're gonna, you know, we're gonna target users with a coupon tied to retention-oriented products? And of course, you know, you're scientists, so you'll do that with a control group and make sure that we'll see if this has the effect that it could have. Like, that's very small, don't get me wrong, this is very, very small of a thing. 
but it can demonstrate that you are able to kind of, um, uh, that you can move a metric, that you can work with a team to do it. So you can start that small. It's, it's not that bad. Uh, and then marketers will go like, wait, this is what science is like? This is how you do it? You experiment and then you see the results? And they'll be like, holy shit, maybe you should do it. Uh, um, and then you have a decision to make. <laughs> uh, if, if it feels too ambitious or too scary to drive revenue, oops, there we go, that's why. I hit like double at a time. I skipped a slide earlier, whatever. Um, you can actually, it's not, no one wants this, and like, there's only so much savings you can do, but you can start there. Savings is not growth, and again, there's only so much spend before you run out, and then you have to go build new revenue, so like, this is not a solution really, but it's a good way to start. And sometimes, you can just make your own company more efficient, and that is good. So I'll give you like, again, narrow, narrow example you could do here, in the, in the kind of in the vein of start with one thing. Um, you probably have a support team of some form. They get emails and calls and messages and tickets. And often they are not good at prioritizing that. Do they prioritize the people who have, you know, who are high potential, that are high spenders? Probably not. Um, so then they solve that by saying, well, let's hire an army of people to try to give everybody a response in like 12 seconds. And then the CEO is like, well, no, we can't afford that. So let's make everything worse. And then that sucks. But you can take kind of, you can analyze user activity and decide, determine, right? We'll call this scoring of some sort. You can determine these are the important users in organizations and they should get a different SLA. And you can help the support team do that. That's not as like big as like we, drew, we drove growth, but that actually does mean you're gonna drive customer satisfaction which then drives retention, which does drive growth, right? So you, if you're in doubt of how to drive like the growth side of the house, you can actually drive the kind of bottom line side of the house and that has really good side effects. Um, we're at Coalesce, third time I say that. Uh, uh, so it is important to do the things well and, and right. Um, all of this is useful because you means you will iterate faster. So look, if you communicate with your team and you um, show them progress every day, good things will happen. And to do that, you probably wanna you know, version your models so that you can make mistakes and correct them. And you wanna be able to deliver things quickly and not, not necessarily as fast as humanly possible, but ideally fast enough to run the experiments. And the faster you do those things, the more you can run those experiments. And that is useful, right? And, and so, you are obviously doing the right thing just by being here and like learning about these technologies and, and, and kind of adopting them. But keeping people updated doesn't have to be yet another dashboard. That's, maybe that's my biggest piece of advice. Comms, when I say comms here, like it could be a stand-up meeting. It could be a daily, a weekly stand-up with the, the downstream teams and showing how the numbers are moving. It could be a Slack update if you're that kind of organization too. The key is iteration. Like I think, Iterating is super, super important here. Um, and so anything you can do to reduce the, the length of the feedback loop, the iteration cycle, the better you will do. So this is what I would call sweating the basics. Okay, this is a big fancy word, aligning incentives. Um, so you can go find a team that wants to work with you, right? Like, okay. Uh, and you want them to look at more than a dashboard. So how would you think about this? So sales teams actually at companies, like when you go sell a product, you have to think about this a lot. because why would someone buy your product if it's not going to do something for them, right? Like when people buy census, it's because like they want to drive a process at the company that will improve their bottom line. That's why they even pay for anything. But it's the same for a project that we do. So you should work with them to have your work be aligned with what they want as a, like their, uh, their incentives. So there's only two ways to do that. One, this is to prevent, by the way, this is to prevent the insights lead to nothing. So one, you conquer the team. This is what I said earlier about the uh, marketing team. You could do that. You could be like, hey, they don't know how to do science. Let's just take over all of marketing. I have met data people who like to do this. I commend you, do it. Um, do it. Uh, uh, really, the world will be a better place. Um, 
Or you have to figure out a way to say, okay, I don't control your team, but we will, when I do work, it will tie to things that you want. That does not mean I want a dashboard. It means like if I tell you this, what will happen on the other side? Are you trying to like improve your SLA for support? Okay, then I will help you deliver that. That's what it means to align incentives. It's very different than saying, I want a dashboard, I will give you the dashboard. It, it, you have to ask the question beyond that and agree that like, all right, nobody wants to clean their duplicate users in the database, okay? Like no one cares about that. What they do care about is sending a better email that drives better retention because the email actually says, hi Joe, to the right Joe, right? That's why you clean up duplicates. Like the goal is not the duplicates. The goal is like the better email that drives retention. That's what you have to align on. Um, none of this matters if people don't like want to work with you and iterate with you. So I will, we're at time pretty much. So I'm going to tell one story on this beyond like build your skills and have an iteration. Yesterday, the day before, we talked a lot about data contracts, right? It's great to have contracts. It doesn't matter if you don't have a culture that goes with it. You, you know, if people are going to rely on you, like the tool will not, will not be the cause. It has to be the, the relationship. And I would say the number one thing that causes us to fail. Actually, the bigger problem, in my opinion, that's very hard to fix, is trust. Right? People don't trust the numbers, they don't trust you, they don't trust that you're going to deliver on these things at the speed that they want. That's why they tend to do it themselves in their own orgs. And this is very hard to solve. Like, trust is very hard to build, right? In life, in personal relationships, in society, right? Like, turns out that's a hard problem now, too. Um, and I have the weirdest piece of advice for you on this. Take you and your team to an improv class. Anyone done that before? It's the weirdest piece of advice, right? You did not see that coming. Two people. Okay, this is, I think, one of the best kept secrets in America. If you take an improv class, in like the first class, they will teach you something that's deep in the culture of improv, which is failure is embraced. Failure will happen. And in fact, they cheer when you do it. So you screw up, like you say the wrong words because you're going so fast. Everyone will stand up and cheer and go like, yeah, you failed. Um, if you're not screwing up, if the data's not wrong once in a while, if you're not, if the experiments go nowhere sometimes, that's good. <laughs> this is the weirdest thing. Like, people want the data to be always correct and, and the experiments to always succeed. And if that were true, I would say you're, you're clearly under swinging as a company, right? If you're not screwing up, at least sometimes, you're either not doing data, talk to any data observability team, they will tell you like, if you're not having mistakes in your data, you're probably not doing data. And two, your company's just not taking enough swings. So this is the thing to bring to the house. Like, if the teams don't wanna work with you, they don't wanna play with you, it's like, you gotta help them become bigger risk takers and you have to become bigger risk takers. So that's the biggest piece of advice. So, you know, TLDR, take more risks, build tighter iteration loops, good things will happen. Thank you.